Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this uh, church that is, uh, that is uh, here this morning. Lord God, we uh, thank you for the many blessings of this life. We pray that you uh, please uh, take this offering and uh, use it to uh, further your word, Lord. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
We'll be on one, page 130 next. Bring it over here. Set it back there. Okay, all the kids. Oh my goodness. Wow. What is all of this? Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. I gotta think here a minute. I'm I'm treasure hunter Tim! Woohoo! Hot! What are you laughing about, crew? <laughs> you think that's funny? <laughs> you guys think it's funny anyway. Hey, I, I'm treasure hunter Tim. I go all around the world hunting for treasure. And I found the ultimate treasure for all of you guys. Let's see. But I don't see it in here. That's my water bottle. That's important, right? Because you don't want to go on a treasure. Oh, yeah. And these are my gloves because sometimes I handle things that might be dangerous or my ropes. And that's not it. Here's my binoculars. Wow. 
I got my binoculars, but well, let's see. Let's see. Okay. Oh, I got my handy dandy pocket knife too. That's important. You don't want to be without your. I might skin me something for supper. No, you don't think so. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, and a flashlight. You guys ever get scared of the dark? Oh, yeah. I won't tell you about the time I was walking on the bridge and I missed and it was ugly. So no, that's not what I'm looking for in and then. Oh, oh here it is. Nope. Well, darn. Oh, this is my don't make fun of my compass. <laughs> See, don't make fun of my compass. Because this compass, it's got me out of a lot of tight spots before. Oh, where and, you and but it's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking. I bet I know where it's at. It is right there. This is it. Wow. I found it. I have searched. Get over on the lap. I have searched the world over, high and low. And I have looked for the perfect treasure. And you know, everywhere I found, I always find a treasure. What do you think's in here? Huh? Crystals? <laughs> Crystals? Crystal coins. Coins? Coins, yes. That's this is song. really cool. Because my treasure searching isn't always for material things. I have a Bible that I carry with me also. And I search treasures for God. And sometimes I find treasures in God's <laughs> Word. And, and I came across this one. For Bible school because it's discovering you're priceless to God. So I wanted to show you God's most priceless treasure. Who You know what it is? Are you ready? Are you ready? What do you see? You see a mirror. I see myself. I see you. I see you. Okay. This is what I want you to see, because there's a piece of plastic on here that you take off like that, and then, what do you see? I see you. You're kind of cute. <laughs> so, this week at Bible school, we want you to know of all the things that God made, of all the money, the diamonds, of all the minerals, of everything God's most priceless treasure is you. God's most priceless treasure is you. So I want to give everybody a mirror because sometimes the world says that you're not worth very much, that you're no good, that you're ugly, that you're short, that you're fat, that you're whatever. Yeah, I'll just throw them at you. Okay. But anyway, I want you to know that you are more than that. Not only that, God's Word tells us He demonstrates His love. He showed you He loved you because Christ died for you. That's how much God loves you. He didn't do that for any other creation, but He did for you. And this week in VBS, we're going to be treasure hunters, and we're going to hunt for treasures, and we're going to use... Pogo, who's the littlest of all, but God knew him. And we're going to look at over here with Ruby. She makes lots of noise, and God hears her. And we're going to look at Grace, who was an ugly little caterpillar, and God made into a beautiful butterfly. And when Peter messed up and denied Christ, God forgave him. Jesus forgave him. Wilder, that little wild monkey who goes around everywhere and makes a lot of noise and, and, and it's just real and nuisance, but God comforts him. And then we're going to look at Raymond the Cayman, not an alligator, master of disguise. And Esther, Esther, who, who was trying to hide as the king's wife, her uncle said, you may think you'll get by with this, but trust me, you won't. And who knows, for maybe such a time as this, God chose you. We'll see how God chooses you. All of that this week in VBS. So let's hunt treasure together. Okay, come, let's pray and then come by and get your mirror, okay? And don't leave. Do not leave because we're going to watch a video in a minute. Okay? Father, thank you for today and thank you for these kids. Help us to show them.
They are priceless to you in your name. We pray. Amen. Hit the video, Dirk. Number three. Okay, hold on. <coughs> Raylan, pass out the mirrors. But don't cut anybody. <laughs> Hit play. Of course, I'm back here. Yes. Meet my friend, Pogo. A poison dart from Yep, this little, tiny, colorful creature without sharp claws, a stinger, or fangs is one of the deadliest animals on the planet. But only if you eat them. Some people call Pogo a poison frog or poison arrow or dark frog. That's because hunters in some native tribes rub their arrow tips on the frog's skin to make them even more dangerous. Poison dart frogs are only about the size of a walnut. They're not big or strong. So how can something so small stay safe? Well, God gave Pogo an easy way to protect himself from bigger animals that might like to have him for a snack. Here in the rainforest, Pogo uses his long, sticky tongue to grab some grub-like ants, termites, or beetles. Mmm, yummy. <laughs> that food changes inside his body, turning into a powerful poison that coats his skin. In fact, frogs that grow up in a zoo or cage don't eat the same things, so they're not poisonous. You'll find Pogo and his brightly colored buddies hopping around in rainforests all over Central and South America. They are pretty puny, but God gave them all these awesome colors. Whoa! Some people call poison dark frogs the jewels of the rainforest. Guess that makes Pogo a treasure, huh? Yeah. And if you still can't see him, just stop and listen. You may think that frogs croak, but he sort of chirps. Listen to this. Their size and sounds are definitely small. Maybe you know what that's like too. Do you ever feel too small to do important or fun things? Does it sometimes feel like you're different from everyone else? Or maybe it feels like everyone else is special or a superstar. You might even be heading to a new school where no one knows you. When you feel too small, overlooked, or not very special, remember that God knows you. God knows everything you can do. Everything you think about, everything you're going through. Every special, amazing part of you. You can treasure God's words in the Bible that say this. Oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. That means someone always understands you and celebrates who you are inside and out. God knows you. You are treasured. I guess at uh, 5 30 is when we're starting, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, sir. And we'll have food, right? Yes, sir. So every night, lots of food. Lots Everybody of food. Everybody better come. <laughs> Everybody make sure to be here to eat at 5 30 and we'll get started. Um, page 194. <clears throat> Oh, what peace we often for. 
Sahara Sands, the hay that's being cut in the California wildfires. They have decided all to converge upon me and cause this thing I had back in February to revisit. And uh, I told one guy, no, I do not have the virus. He said, you've been tested. No, I've already had five Q-tips shoved up my nose this year. I'm not real excited about another one. But if it's what it takes, fine. Uh, do me a prayer for Jared and uh, Casey. They're recovering from the virus. We found out Wednesday night Jared tested positive. Casey tested positive Thursday. Their symptoms are very mild. Jerry and Teresa are uh, in, in quarantine. Uh, but everybody's doing, doing fine. And uh, just what they have to go through. Fatigue is uh, the biggest one that they're facing. Robbie... Uh, uh, Sloan and Jerry Faulkner both are in Arizona. Brother's funeral will be, uh, memorial service will be tomorrow. Uh, keep that family in your prayer. I'm waiting on a link. Uh, she posted on Facebook the uh, obituary, and she's put some really awesome pictures of, uh, of her family on. Uh, but she said they are supposed to, to live cast the uh, service. So I'm waiting for the link on that one. I have not uh, received it yet. Margaret's daughter, Katie, is doing better. It's been a roller coaster week for them this past week. Uh, but right now, the still a lot of joint swelling and, and hives breaking out. So continue. Pray for, uh, for them. You know, treasure. What's the treasure that you seek? What is the treasure? that We all have our treasures that we seek. Maybe it's clothes. Obviously, that's not true for me today. Uh, maybe it's vehicles. Maybe it's homes, vacations. Maybe it's just the quest for more money, power, prestige. What, what is the treasure that you seek? How do you seek it? What do you do to find that treasure? Some, some people travel around the world seeking that treasure. I'm reminded in Matthew, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave two parables about that treasure of great price. Man bought a field, or was looking at a field, and found treasure buried there. And according to law, whatever is there when he purchases it is his. And he went and sold everything he had so he could buy that field and obtain that treasure. There's a pearl of great price where the man was seeking the pearl. He found it and sold all he had. What I want you to see is the treasure that we, that we seek. Jesus even said, why lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth? Rust, moths, thieves. It's here today and gone tomorrow. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So when we look at treasures, what are our treasures? And, and why? Why do we seek it? You know, I'd love the theme preparing this week. Not the decorations, but just the preparation. The greatest treasure God has given us on earth was just sitting right down here in front of us. 
What a treasure. And the greatest thing we can do with that treasure is what we're doing this week. You know, I'm about ready to say we've got about as many kids in here as we do adults. And I know a lot of churches that can't say that. Treasures. You're God's greatest treasure. And yet we seek for all of these things. And really it's to no avail. When the greatest treasure that we have, we look in the mirror and we see. Now it's not one of those, wow, when God made me, he did good. He needed to break the mold after me. I know a lot of people said, I hope he did break the mold because we don't need another of you. No, but, but it's not the, the arrogance or the conceit that is there. No, it's looking. Now, now I want you to stop and, 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 and think about this a bit. You are fearfully, wonderfully made in God's image. You realize everything that God created, he spoke into existence except one. What was that? Man, us. And only we are made in his image. God took a handful of dirt and he blew into it the breath of life and man was made. He took a rib out of man and made woman out of man. It's literally what woman means. And we are created in his image. Isn't it amazing, Gary, you read from 139th Psalm today in our Sunday school devotional, and our memory verse for this morning was 139.1, and I'm thinking about 139, 15, and 16, fearfully and wonderfully we are made. God knows all our days before even one of them are fashioned. None of the creation God says that about. So I want you to think about that as, as, as we treasure hunt this week. But I want you to think about this treasure. John 3, 16. I'll tell you what, if you know it, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. I love these kids doing their memory verses. You teachers have done good. Now, why do I say that? Treasure, you are priceless to God. Priceless to God. I want to look at that treasure hunt. I want you to see three things today that makes you priceless. And you need to discover your priceless to God. What are they? He sought you, he bought you, and he brought you. Sought you, bought you, and brought you. And we see that in John 3, 16 and other verses following. When we look at, at, at God, he sought you. Matthew 18, 11 through 14. You'll know this one. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, one of them goes astray. Does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains and seek that one that is strayed? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than the other 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives us life for his sheep. John 10, going on 14, 15, and 16, he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I and am known by my own. My father knows me. Even so, I know the father and I lay down my life for my sheep and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. So them also I must bring that they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. He went out and sought you. He went out and found you. You know, that doesn't mean much unless you are that one of the hundred. It's easy for us to be the 99 and say, no big deal. But what if you are the one? What if you're the one that went out? He went and looked for you. I want you to think about this a minute 
It's not like we just have church open the doors and say, y'all come. If you're going to get saved, you'll get saved. If not, well, you'll figure it out. No. The shepherd went out and found his sheep. I love it when Jesus said, I have other sheep also. I got to go get. I got to find them. We want to say, we got enough. We got enough. We never have enough. Never enough. There's always one more. There's always one more. There's going to be a prodigal that's out there. There's going to be one that's just hard-headed. You guys ever ever watched sheep? You ever read about sheep? You ever you ever took care of sheep? Sheep are very stubborn. We we want to say a donkey is stubborn. I believe a sheep has got it covered. I believe a sheep does knows better. And 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 we we are compared. How are we compared in the Bible? We're compared to sheep. And I think that's probably a really good thing. A sheep has one thing in mind. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat. And a sheep will just keep munching that grass, munching that grass. I'm getting a little way away from the herd. No big deal. Munch that grass. Well, I can still see them. Where'd they all go? And a sheep can get itself stuck between two rocks in a corner. And rather back out, it will continue to go forward. And it will just go bah, 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 which is just like alarm to every predator that's around. So the shepherd knows the urgency of finding that sheep. I've got to go find him before a predator does. We are out there and God is seeking us. He's searching for us. He, searched, he sent out the best search party there was. His son, Jesus Christ. He said, go. Jesus said, I didn't come only to the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus said, there's other sheep I've got to go and find. I'm going to leave the 99 over here, and I'm going to go and find it. How about Luke 15? We know it as a prodigal son. What man of you have, or that, that 15? But at the very first of this, he gives two other parables. What man of you having 100 sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it up. Now, catch this. He picks it up, lays it on his shoulders, and he's walking back home with him. And I like to picture this. This is Tim and my, my mind and how it works. I want to picture him, that little, that little sheep that's out there that's gone astray, that knows he's in trouble, that's been, been, been bad, bad, bad all day long to no avail, knows he's going to die unless the shepherd gets there soon. And that shepherd finds him and picks him up. That little sheep's just wore out. And he puts him on his back and carries him home. And he's loving that sheep. It's okay, Fluffy. I'm here. I told you I'd never leave you or forsake you. I told you that I would always be there for you. I got here for you, Fluffy. It'll be okay. And, and it's not one of those stupid sheep. What's the matter with you? You knew better than that. I should have let you out there to die. I, next time you do this, he lovingly, lovingly. And it says not only that, when he gets back home, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep which is lost. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. The ninety-nine just who need no repentance. What makes the angels in heaven rejoice when that lost sheep comes home? God sought you. He was on a mission. He sent his son. For God so loved the world... He sent a search party to look for you. He sent a shepherd to find the lost sheep. You are a priceless treasure because no one else did God send his son to accept the lost sheep. He sought you. But not only that, didn't just sought you, he bought you. He bought you. We know the story of Hosea where he was told to go and marry the harlot, a woman of harlotry. She had three kids and she kept selling herself out to her lovers, not going home to where one day her lovers were done with her and put her up on the auction block as a slave. And God told Hosea, go and buy her back. And Hosea went putting all of the indifference, all of what she had done, the embarrassment, the heartache that she had caused him, and 
and did what God had told him to do. And he bought her and he took her home. God has bought you. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. He bought you. Do you know how much you cost? Do you know how much you cost? Do you know how much you're worth? Everything. God so loved the world, he gave. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was that perfect lamb. He was the price. The word in, in 1 John, that big theological word is called propitiation. Let me put it to you real quickly. He died so you don't have to. He paid that price. What price? Why? Why did he have to die? Because when we look at the Old Testament, the way that salvation was attained, sins were forgiven, was they would have to shed the blood of the lamb, of the goat, of the bull ox, of the dove. The blood had to be shed and spilled at the foot of the altar, sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. For that one moment, forgiveness was given. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood had to be shed. And Jesus' blood was shed for us. He was that sacrifice. He bought us. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. I like that word grace. That word grace over there, that butterfly over by K, that butterfly. You know, the, the, the thing about a butterfly is butterflies just aren't born. Butterflies metamorphosize. Butterflies start out a little caterpillar. Every one of you little kids in here, I hope your mom and dad have pictures of you. Jill found a picture of me when I was like four years old. And here's what I look like. And I mean, I am toe-headed. I've got a burr haircut, and here's what I look like. <laughs> am I right, Jill? That's exactly right. That's not me. I have metamorphosized. I like that word. I morphed into what I am today. I grew. Bill and, and Sue and I, Jill, we were talking this morning about all these little kids, and, and, and they, they're all growing up. Some of them are getting ready to be teenagers. And the ones that were babies, they're not babies anymore. They're up and walking and running and, and all of these things. You're growing. You metamorphosize into adults. You start out that little scruggly caterpillar. It's all fuzzy and all he does is just eat leaves. Chomp, 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 chomp. And after a while, that caterpillar, oh, I'm getting sleepy. And, and I think, I don't understand this, I think I'll hang upside down. I'll just build this little house around me. And he goes to sleep in that little cocoon, a cocoon that's there, goes to sleep. And after a period of time, it's time to wake up. And he starts stretching, but that little cocoon is already real tight. So what's he do? He wants to bust out of it. And, and he does bust out of that cocoon. But when he busts out, he knows something. Hey, what's this? I don't have to crawl anymore. He has wings and he can fly. And there's a freedom that's there now because he's no longer that caterpillar. What you are right now, you won't be forever. You won't be forever. You know, what you are is a sinner. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells us that we're going to die, but we don't have to die eternally separated from God. Because the Bible tells us God demonstrates his love toward us, and while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't have to stay a sinner. Christ became that sin for us so that we don't have to die. And we no longer have to be that ugly little struggling caterpillar. We can be a beautiful butterfly. And we can do that. Fly. Fly. Why do you want to crawl when you can fly? Romans 3, 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation, that substitution by his blood, the blood of Jesus, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. What's he saying? That's a lot of big words that's there. What is he saying? He's saying that we're justified because of the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood, his death on the cross, satisfied what God needed for salvation. He sought us and he bought us. He paid that price. Anybody paid anything for you? Anybody sacrificed for you? You kids out there, I'll tell you this right now, your parents have a lot. A lot. And they will continue. Christ sacrificed himself. They didn't take his life. He gave his life. He sought you. He bought you. And thirdly, you're priceless because he brought you. He brought you that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He brought you to everlasting life. Jesus in John chapter 11 verses 25 and 26 Lazarus has died Jesus goes and Martha meets him and Jesus said to her after their conversation Lord if, I, if you were here I know I know my brother would not have died but whatever you ask and God, ask God I know he'll, he'll do Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Do you believe this? Whoever believes in him shall never die because he's been brought into an everlasting relationship. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not been yet revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We've been brought into a relationship with Jesus. We've been brought into literally a family of God. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we have been brought to eternal life. We have been brought to an eternal family. We have been brought to an eternal kinship. We are children of God. We acknowledge that God created us. God knew what he was doing. He really did. Why would he make, and I love that, Pogo the Frog, the smallest of all of them, but the most deadly of all of them. Just touching it can cause death. And God knew that. And yet God took Jesse, his sons, the smallest one, David, and made him to be king. Yeah, you know, it didn't sound like too much until David, a young teenager, went out and fought a giant named Goliath and brought him down. And then people started to look. And to think, you're part of God's family. He sought you, he bought you, and he brought you. You know, it kind of reminds me of a song. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. 
He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He sought me and he bought me so he could I know this is bad English but it's got to stay with me. He could brought me into that loving relationship with him. It's not enough to know of him. You have to know him personally. I love it. Some of these kids. Jill. One of those kids. Hey, Miss Jill! Don't you love it when those kids call you? You know why they call your name? Because they know you. They have a personal relationship with you. Love it when I'm out somewhere and one of these kids says, Hey, preacher! Love it. And Griffin... Gavin, they're probably the worst. <laughs> but you just keep on hollering, kids. Doesn't bother me a bit. But we know each other. How many of you, how many of you have that kind of relationship? <laughs> hey, God! Hey, Jesus! How many of you have that kind of relationship? Or how many of us have to go and go, <clears throat> can't even look, God, because, well, I messed up. Hey, wait a minute, that's tonight. No, Wednesday night. God hears, no, tonight. God hears us. He hears you whether you whisper. He hears you whether you cry out. What kind of relationship do you have with God? It can't be that all business. That's not what God's about. He sought you and bought you because he loves you. And he wants that none should perish but all have everlasting brought us. He brought us to the place where he wants us to say, I believe. I believe. Have you come to that place in your life? Are you ready to discover you are priceless to God and that he gave everything he had so that you can have what you have and you can have an everlasting relationship with I'd be lost with that God in my life every day. Not just lost, but literally lost. Would you, this morning, we want to give you the opportunity to come and to start that relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he sought you, he's seeking you today. He bought you, the price has already been paid. All you have to do is acknowledge, and he will bring you to that everlasting relationship with him. What would be your pleasure, would you? What's your phone number, John? Big Red Book 312. Big Red Book, page 312. Let's stand and have a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for Vacation Bible School. May it bring.